Well, I've, uh, I'm a bearer of uh, good news this uh, morning, and I'd like to share them with the church. It's been for a while, so last December, the Avon de la Vie, um, College decided to sell its aviation program, and it was advertised on the record. I remember reading it on the record, and then on a Sunday morning, uh, praying about it, and the Lord clearly impressing me, you need, I'm going to give you this aviation program, I uh, want you to go and uh, make a bid. So on the other side uh, of uh, New South Wales, in my, you know, my brother-in-law was feeling impressed in the same way, so he, we, we put a group together and we had a meeting with the Avondale uh, College people. And we gave them a bid for, or an offer for $500,000. Of course, of those $500,000, we owned zilch. We didn't have a cent with us. Well, they accepted the offer seriously. They took our offer seriously. We talked to them about that this was a faith project, that we didn't have any money, but yet still we were making an offer. <laughs> well, they accepted seriously. We thought we were, they were going to laugh at us, but they didn't. Then we waited for four months, and a couple of, couple of weeks ago, we had another meeting with uh, Avondale uh, College, John Cox and uh, the second person uh, in charge, and they told us that uh, they were considering our offer very seriously, and that we, we were part of uh, four other groups that were bidding for the aviation program. We came out all excited. This is a miracle, we said. The Lord is telling us that uh, he wants to give us the aviation program. Now, there are five planes. And also, they told us that they had dropped the price from uh, $500,000 to $320,000 for the planes. More excited we were. Though we didn't have a cent, we were more excited. And so, uh, we... We talked to the board and we let them know and we devised a, a strategy and we are going to have a, a business meeting to present it to the church. But the strategy that we presented to the board is basically that uh, the, the aviation program is going to be independent of Penrith Church so that uh, Penrith Church and Penrith Church members will have no legal or financial liabilities attached to the aviation program, but that uh, there will be a moral a uh, link between uh, Penrith and the aviation, no financial or legal ties in case there is, of course, a, a legal suit against the aviation program, then Penrith Church will not be attached to it and there will be no dangers. Well, with the permission of the board, uh, we were happy, not permission, but a moral saying, yes, you know, we are happy for you to go ahead and uh, then we need to present this to the business meeting to let the church inform the church what's going on. Last week we had a meeting on Tuesday with uh, two businessmen that they heard about what was going on with the aviation program. And two, good, two pieces of good news came out of that meeting. I'll give you the first one. The first one is that one of these businessmen, an Adventist man, has been called by the Lord to live by faith, but also the Lord has given him or placed on his hands licenses for two AM radio stations. The only two AM licenses available in Sydney have been made available to this man, and this man says that now they, we can use them. Amen. Did you hear that? Amen. The only two, and now we are going to have meetings with the owner of the licenses to see if we can buy them, because we want to have uh, the ownership of the licenses. We'll see what comes up, but whether we buy them or not, they, 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 the licenses have already been made available to us. We are going to raise a big tower in the center, 80 meter uh, tall tower, and we are going to reach easily all the way to Newcastle, no, not to Newcastle, all the way to Castle Hill <laughs> with, the, with the signal. That's very, very clear. From then on, it could reach all the way to the city uh, easily, so uh, we'll wait and see. There's, and there's two of them. But the second piece of good news is that while we were sitting with a group of, uh, uh, you know, Shane Cutler, Quinton, Angelo, myself, and my brother-in-law, Oscar, we were sitting, talking to them, and uh, we, they, they, they started querying us in regards to the 
uh, aviation program. And uh, especially one of the men and says, what is stopping you from getting the aviation program? And so we said, well, we've got uh, the financial issue that uh, we've got uh, $320,000 that we don't have, that the Lord will provide. We are 100% sure of that, we said to him. And uh, then we have the licensing issues and the, the service, the obtaining the services of a chief fly, flying, in, uh, flying instructor. And then the fact that we need to set up a company. And the man said, the money is not a problem. I'll pay for it. Amen. Well, we all went, Woo! Praise the Lord! And then the other man said, what else did you, you, you said a company? He said, I'm all, I, two years ago, I set up a company, a non-for-profit organization, and it's been sitting on my shelf for two years. I give it to you, he said. You can use it. Amen. You know, it'll take about four to six months to organize such a company. And now we already have it. And the name of the company is without, uh, what is it? With no exceptions. That's perfect to what we are doing. And then on Thursday morning, I received an email with the letterhead of the businessman that promised the money, writing to John Cox and says, Dear John Cox, I want to congratulate you on the purchase of, uh, you know, Avon the Aviation by, uh, cannot be hidden, I make myself guarantor of $370,000 is available within 48 hours whenever you ask for the money. Amen. We, friends, have seen a miracle. Amen? Amen? Praise the Lord! So, friends, now we have the money to buy the planes. Some of you were scared, thinking that, oh, how much is going to cost the church and we're going to go in such big debt. It has cost us not one cent. Amen? Amen. Have we got any to fear, friends? No. no. We have nothing to be afraid of because the Lord is the one who has been leading us and is the Lord who will lead us all the way. I, it is my belief that in September this year, we will have an aviation program that will begin to train um, um, pilots, but also will be reaching into the inner parts of New South Wales with medical service and the gospel to those who, communities that do not have a service. Amen? Amen? But not only that, friends. It is my belief that the Lord wants to give us not only Australia, but He wants to give us the South Pacific. And it is the plan of the Lord that He will expand it very quickly because time is short and we will have an aviation program in all the islands of the South Pacific because God is moving fast. He wants to finish the gospel. Amen? And I don't want to hear church members being upset, friends, or being scared. We have nothing to be afraid. This is not Pastor Braga moving ahead. This is not the church moving ahead. This is God moving ahead. And if we don't move ahead, God is going to give it to someone. And one day we're going to say, oh, it could have been us. And let me tell you, I don't want to be in that position. Amen? And so, friends, we are going to have in a few months two radio stations that will belong to us and we will be preaching the gospel 24 hours a day here in Sydney. But it is the plan of God that this not only happens in Sydney, it will happen all over Australia. And God will give us this year television stations, friends, and it will not only be in Sydney, it will be all over Australia. And so, as Michael said... Hold on to your seats because God is moving fast. And when He moves fast, it's scary, friends. Amen? Amen? So I want to praise the name of the Lord with all my heart this morning. He is a faithful God who when He promises, He fulfills His promises. And I want to worship Him and adore Him as our God. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. We are going to kneel down and we are going to pray to thank Him. Let us kneel down. Our Father in heaven, this morning we kneel before your presence as a church, as your people, as a family. We, we kneel before your presence to worship you, Lord. For who are we that you have chosen us to do such marvelous work? 
Who are we, dear Lord, that we are to see your hand at work in our midst? Who are we, dear Lord, that you have called us to proclaim the final message to the human race? Dear Lord, we humble ourselves before your presence, for we are weak and sinful, prone to err, Lord, and to insult your name. Father, forgive us because many of us did not believe that you were going to do this. Forgive us, Father, because many of us were scared, dear Lord, and were talking, Father, and creating this union. Forgive us, dear Lord. And in the name of Jesus, I pray, dear Lord, that you will exalt your name through us. I pray, dear Lord, that uh, the whole of Australia and the South Pacific will know about Jesus and his soon return through the ministry, Lord, that you are leading us to do. May no man be exalted through this, Father. May no human being take honor and glory. But, Lord, may your name be exalted and glorified forever. And may the name of Jesus ring through the ears of all people here in Australia and through the South Pacific, so that when Jesus returns, there will be thousands upon thousands of people who will be ready waiting for him, thanks to the work you are doing through us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I think I could finish now, sit down. <laughs> That's a sermon in itself. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Open your books in the book of uh, Job. Now, did you, did you see our brand new lectern? You can't even see it. The deacon came to, uh, to me this morning and said, are you going to need a lectern? I said, it's already there. I said, oh, yeah, I haven't seen it. It's, all, it's here, you see. It's nice and clear. So um, for those who preach, they, you can't shake your knees anymore because everyone will see it. Come to the book of Job. No, not Job, Joel. Joel. I've been studying the, uh, studying the book of Joel this week. And it has made a deep impression in my mind. And I'd like to share some of, my, some of what the Lord has impressed my mind with as I've looked into the book of Joel. Now, the book of Joel is a very interesting book. The name Joel means Yahweh is my God. And the very name sets the context for the book when you read the book, you will find that Joel never tells us in what era of Israel's history he ministered. We do not have a historical context for the book of Joel. Joel writes his name. He tells us the name of his father, Pethuel, and that's all we know about Joel. Joel is never again mentioned in the whole of the book. We only know that someone named Joel, who was a prophet, wrote this book, and out of that, we have nothing else, no more information. We do not know under what kings he ministered. We do not know what was the situation of Israel or Judah in the days he ministers. We know nothing. And at first, you begin to wonder and say, well, why did he write the book? But when you read the book, you will find that the book of Joel was not written for Israel or Judah. The book of Joel was written for the last days. The book of Joel is a message for those who are living in the last very minutes of human history. The book of Joel has only three chapters. Chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3. Chapter 1 presents the attack of an army, foreign army, against the land, Israel. Chapter 2 presents the attack of another army against the land. And then it presents the reaction of God's people, the inhabitants of the land, towards the second attack. And then it presents what God will do for His people in order to prepare them for this second army. 
And finally, Joel chapter 3, show us what will do God do in the last days to judge the nations. It's a final day's message. And this morning I'd like us to study it because it has amazing connotations for you and for me. Chapter 1 of Joel begins saying the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. He, this, you oldest, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days? Or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth, for a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and throw it, thrown it away. Its branches are made white. Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of, your, of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who ministers to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns. The grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Be ashamed, you farmers, well, you vine dressers, for the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field has perished. The vine has dried up, and the fig tree has withered. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the palm and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of men. Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. Well, you who minister before the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a distraction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before your eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of our God. The seed shrivels under the clods. Storehouses are in shambles. Bands are broken down, for the grain has withered. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle are restless, because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of the sheep, sheep suffer punishment. O oh Lord, to you I cry out. For fire has devoured the open pastures, and a flame has burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up, and fire has devoured the open pastures. When you read that first chapter, immediately grabs your attention that there is a sense of imminent danger and urgency to the message of Joel, isn't it? There is an army that Joel says that will attack the land. And in the words of Joel chapter 1 verse 4, this army is described. It says in verse 4, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. The symbolic imagery of this chapter is presenting a, a locust 
plague that has come on the land. And the results are utter destruction on the land. Now, friends, let me tell you something. This chapter has literal implications for the world today. Locusts in the scripture are a symbol of demons. What are locusts a symbol of in the scriptures? Demons. I want you to notice in verse 6. Verse 6 says, For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. But notice now the change from the plural to the singular. It says strong and without number. His teeth, a teeth of a lion, and he has the fangs of a fierce lion. Who does the lion represent in the scriptures? The lion represents two people actually. The lion is a symbol of Jesus, but the lion also is a symbol of Satan. Jesus is a lion that saves and protects. Satan is a lion that destroys and causes havoc. Now, the picture of verse 6 is a picture of a lion protecting or destroying. It's a picture of a lion destroying, friends. So this army of locusts are a symbol of demonic activity attacking the church of God. I want to show you that this picture is shown everywhere in the scriptures. If you come to the book of Ezekiel, don't lose Joel because we will come back to Joel, but if you come to the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38 and 39. Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshech, and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords, Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, are with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer and all its troops, the house of Togama from the far north, and all its troops, many people are with you. Prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered to about you, and be a, be a guard for them. After many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come into the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations and now all of them dwell safely safety the picture of the whole world gathered together to destroy god's people israel i want you to notice in chapter 39 and verse 2 where does this army come from and i will turn you around and lead you on on bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of israel where do they come from they come from the north. If you come to the book, of, uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 11, here this king is again presented. This is what we call the king of the north. This is what we call the king of the north. Chapter 11 of the book of Daniel, verses 40 onwards. The Bible predicts that in the last days, Satan 
will move with all his evil spirits to bring the world together to attack and destroy God's people. Daniel chapter 11 verses 40 onwards says, At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him with a whirlwind, with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he, shall, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. There, we have two pictures here. I will have to just tell you, and uh, I don't have the time to explain every symbol here. But we have the king of the south and the king of the north. In prophecy, the king of the south is a symbol of atheism and all the isms controlling the world. Rationalism, humanism, atheism, communism taking control of the world. And since the year 1798, since the time when the French Revolution took place in France in, 19, in, in 1793, atheism controls humanity. All the isms, communism, rationalism, humanism, are the forces that are controlling the human mind. But according to the scriptures, a new king is rising and he will defeat the king of the south. What is the name of that king? He's the king of the north. Or Babylon. Or false religion. According to the scriptures, false religion will rise again to control the world as it did during the Middle Ages. And the, 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 the results will be catastrophic for the human race. Friends, for over 200 years, the world has enjoyed, especially the Western world, a kind of religious peace. The world has been controlled by rationalistic attitudes towards life. God has been kicked out of the picture, and now all that we see around us is explained in scientific terms. There is no need for God. We call that humanism a rationalistic approach to life. The Bible is predicting, and we are seeing the demise of the king of the south, and the king of the north is rising back to power. False religion. A religion that claims to serve God. A form of religion that appears to follow the scriptures. A form of religion, friends, that it looks like it is Christianity, but it's not. According to the scriptures, this form of Christianity, this form of religion, will control the world. Notice what it says in verse 40. It says that it will come with chariots, this is symbolic language, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. Verse 41, he shall also enter the glorious land. What is the glorious land? What is the glorious land? It is the church. It is Israel. The glorious land. And it says, and many shall be overthrown. Where? In the glorious land. And then it says, but these shall escape from his hand. Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries. And the land of Egypt, which is the land of the south, the king of the south, shall not escape. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver, over all the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. I want to stop there for a little while, friends. The Bible is saying that an army of, a, of universal proportions is being raised up. Behind this army is all the demonic activity and power that are behind them, supporting them with one purpose. They are being, being gathered together to destroy the church of God. And as they do this, verse 43 says that they will take control of all the economical power of this world. They will control the gold and the silver and all the treasures of the world will be in their hands. And 
This registration was talking about the meltdown of the American economy. What is it? The meltdown of the American economy. Okay, thank you. Now, the meltdown of the American economy. And friends, he, with the American economy, if the American economy melts down, whose economy is going to melt down? The world's economy. I was reading a report by a group of financial experts saying that it is too late for Europe not to be affected. It is too late for China not to be affected. At the end of this year, or beginning of the other, when the American economy collapses so badly, the whole world economy is going to crash down and it's going to bring us down to a state worse than the 1930s. And these are not Christian people who are saying it. These are financial experts telling us what is going to happen. And according to the scriptures, friends, this is a sign of the rising king of the north because in order for false religion to take control of the world, what they will do? They will crash the economy and out of this horrible crash, they will rise in a new system called the new world order. In the new world order, friends, there will only be one legal religion accepted one head of that religion. And those who are not there, the Bible says, won't be able to buy or sell. Now, if you are not able to buy or sell, this means that the state has absolute control of the financial system. Yes or no? A system will be created that will control you in every sense of the word, and if you do not surrender to what they are demanding, they will only press a button and you will not be able to buy or sell anymore. Forget about going to Coles and get your shopping grocery. Forget about going to the petrol station and filling up your car with petrol. It will be all over if you, do not, if you want to live according to your conscience. And the book of Joel presents this attack as a swarming locust that covers the whole land. But let me tell you, friends, there is a, there, though that, that sounds scary, it's not so scary. It's only scary when we are not prepared. But there is one aspect that is very scary. If you come to Daniel chapter 11 and verse 41, it tells us that this army, the king of the north, in its process of controlling the world, one of the first areas of attack is the church of God, including the Seventh-day Adventist church and the Christian church. In order to create a form of Christianity that the people will take as, uh, uh, as Christianity, they have to take control and destroy true Christianity. True? Come back with me. We'll, we'll be back to Daniel, but come with me to Joel. And I want to show you in Joel how Joel, in symbolic language, shows how this army of locusts destroys everything that Christianity stands for. Joel chapter 1. And if we begin from verse 5 onwards, we begin here to understand the amazing attack of this system of religion, which is a union of Christianity, spiritualism, and Catholicism together, which brings everything together and makes up a big blob of religion that appears Christian but has nothing of Christianity in its heart. In verse 5 says, Awake, you drunkards! And weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine. Why is he saying that? Joel is talking to the people of God and he say, Awake, you who've been drunk for so long. Why is he saying this? Because he's going to show us what Satan is going to do inside God's church. And then he says, Because the wine, for it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. 
His teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he has fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. What is the vine a symbol of in the Scriptures? What is the vine a symbol of in the Scriptures? It's a symbol of Israel. But in the New Testament, the vine is a symbol of the church. And the fruit of the vine is a symbol of what, friends? The fruit of the vine is a symbol of the blood of the covenant that was spilled for us on Calvary's cross. Amen? The blood of Jesus that was spilled as the only means of salvation. True? Are you following me? What did Jesus say that evening? When he lifted up the Jews, what did he speak about? And what was it? It was the fruit of the vine, the juice of the vine, yes or no? It became a symbol of the blood of Christ. And according to Joel, it says that one of the first things that this army attacks is the full reliance that we have on the blood of Christ. And then it says, he has laid waste my vine and ruined my fig tree. He has stripped it bare and thrown it away. Its branches are made wide. Both the vine and the fig tree are symbol of the church of Christ. This army comes against the church and it strips it bare. No fruit in it. What is the fruit of the vine and the, and the, and the fig tree a symbol of? Remember when Jesus came to the fig tree? To look for fruits and found no fruit. What did he do with the fig tree? He cursed it. Why? Because there was no fruit in the, in the fig tree, friends. What is the fruit a symbol of? The fruit is a symbol of the character of Christ reproduced in the church. What is this saying? He's saying that this attack is going to be so deceptive, so powerful, that people will be led to trust in something else but the blood of Jesus. And the result will be something else but the character of Christ Jesus, friends. And then it says in verse 6, 8, Lament like a virgin, girded with sackcloth for, her, for, the, for the husband of her youth. Who is the virgin in the Bible? He's the church. And who is the husband of the church? Jesus Christ, and according to here, friends, the Bible is calling us to lament because of the attack. The church has lost Christ. Now let me ask you a question. Is it serious, the attack that is coming and that has come against the church? Is it serious, friends? Is of the greatest of magnitudes. Notice what it says then. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priest mourn who ministered to the Lord. What was cut off from the house of the Lord? What was cut off? The grain offering and the drink offering. What are they symbols of? They are symbols of the Old Testament sanctuary where a grain offering and a drink offering was presented to the Lord with every sacrifice that was presented for the salvation of Israel. That has been cut off. There is no more drink offering. There is no more uh, uh, grain offering. Notice then it says in verse nine, uh, 10, the field is wasted. The land mourns for the grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. What is the land? A ch the church again. And what is it mourning for? Because there is no grain. What is the grain? A symbol of the Word of God. There is no wine. What is the wine? A symbol of the blood of Jesus. And there is no oil. What is the oil? A symbol of? The Holy Spirit. Friends, please listen. Satan has calculated an attack upon the church. And this, this attack is so well calculated that if we allow him within the church, he will destroy your hope in Jesus. 
He will destroy the power of the blood of Christ. He will destroy the power of the Holy Spirit. And He will destroy the power of the Word of God to transform you and make you a, a, a being in the likeness of Christ. He will leave us wandering as cattle who have no food, as animals who have no water. Do you think that this is important? This is the final attack on God's church. And let me tell you, friends, as a minister, I tell you, the attack is not in the future. The attack is already here. Did you hear that? The attack is not in the future, but the attack is already here. According to Daniel chapter 11, the prediction is, friends, that one of the first things that Satan will try to do is to infiltrate the Christian church, to infiltrate the Seventh-day Adventist church, and to create in it such confusion that people will have no idea why you're a Seventh-day Adventist. People will have no idea of the Word of God. People will have no idea, no reliance of the importance of the blood of Jesus Christ. And as I look around today, friends, most Christians, most Seventh-day Adventists have no clue why we are Christians, why we are Seventh-day Adventists. Amen. The work of Satan against Christianity and the Seventh-day Adventist church have been so well planned and dear friends, it had caught us as, as men who are drunk and do not know what is going on. And it's time to wake up. The Bible says, friends, that eventually Satan will round up the whole world against God's people. And that is the swarming locust. And that which the crawling locust did not eat, this other locust will eat, and his work will be so final, so complete, in his intention, dear friend. Listen to this. In his, is Satan's in, intention to wipe you out completely from the surface of existence. Let me... Tell you, did you know that there are plans at high level to reduce the world population to one billion? Did you know that? I heard that in 2GB, on a night program, Brian Wilshire. And when this man talks, he talks because he knows. And he says that there are plans at high level, you know, the presidents and prime ministers and kings of the world are talking that they want to reduce the population to one billion. Now what is this, friends? Did you know, for example, that in, in, in the United States of America, there are more than 800 concentration camps ready to be used and they are empty at the moment? Did you know, for example, that there are fields that they have hundreds of thousands of plastic coffins stored there for, for a purpose? I do not know what purpose. Did you know that the United States, um, uh, the Senate of the United States of America is setting up itself and getting ready for a major revolution within the United States? Friends, why am I talking about the United States of America? Because the Bible says that we are to look to the United States of America as the final movements of prophecy take place. But you know what, friends? Though that sounds scary, what's happening within the church is a hundred times more scary. If someone was to stop you on the street and ask you, why are you a Christian? What would you say? If someone was going to ask you, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? What would you say? Now, if you are confused, if you do not know, there are two chances. One, you are just a brand new person who's starting to become a Christian and you don't know how to give an answer. That's fine with you. But if you are a Seventh-day Adventist who's been an Adventist for years and you do not know how to give an answer, let me tell you, the locust is eating you. Let me ask you a question, friends. How is the character of Christ being formed in you? How precious is the blood of Jesus upon you? How reliant are you upon the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your own life? How, friends? If they are just passing comments that they do not really matter in your life, then the locusts are eating you and they are tearing you apart. The army is doing a mighty job within the church. Amen? Amen? And let me tell you, friends, I'm talking, the last meeting I talked, I talked on the second coming of Christ. And this meeting, the Lord impressed me again to talk on these things. Because 
The final battle is just around the corner, friends. On the side of darkness, everything is ready. The world has collided together. It's just a matter of final order, and they will march. On God's side, we are not. On God's side, we are still deciding the way we're going to dress, what we're going to eat. In, the, in God's side, we are still deciding whether we still like each other or not. On God's side, we are still fighting over little things. On, 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 on God's side, we are still arguing amongst family issues, amongst church issues. We are still fighting over the color of the carpet and whether it's good to have cameras or not. We are still fighting, friends, over non-important things that have no consequence on eternal life, while there, the army that has prepared is fully trained, fully ready to come and zoom, zap you out of the existence of planet Earth. Can you, can you see what I'm saying, friends? And God says, in verse 13 of chapter 1 of Joel, gird yourselves and lament, you priests, Wail, you who minister before the altar, come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God, for the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast, call the sacred assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out to our Lord, Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand and it shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before our eyes? Joy and gladness from the house of the Lord. Dear friends, if you think that the end still a few years ahead, let me give you the good news. No, friends, the end has arrived. Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming, friends. That which we as a people have preached for the last 160 years is being fulfilled before our own eyes. Did you watch the visit of the Pope to the United States of America? Have you checked the internet and see the speeches and see when he prayed in Ground Zero? Have you heard the people of America praising him and exalting him before the world? What has a Catholic leader do in a Protestant country? How is it that Protestant people are praising the man that killed Protestants by the millions 200 years ago? How can we as Protestants, friends, praise a man who is the very element, the very hand of Satan to bring in the last war against God's people? We have preached for 150 years that America and the papacy will be united together. And we saw it a couple of weeks ago. What are we doing, friends? Shouldn't we screaming these things out of the rooftops to let people know that the end is here? Friends, we don't have to wait for the end. If you do not get ready for the end, the end will crush you. I'm sorry, friends. I'm your pastor. And it is my duty as a pastor to warn you. I'd rather be treated as a scare, a scare mongrel who you went around scaring everyone than if, the, if, the, if these things move on than my sheep be caught unawares and then they turn to me and say, you never warned us of these things. Amen? Amen? Amen. If I have to shout, I'll shout, friends. Because what I'm seeing, what I'm feeling, I have never seen it. I have never seen it in my life, and I've been an Adventist all my life. Friends, I have never in my life seen God at work as I'm seeing Him today. I, I, I have never seen the enemy at work as I'm seeing Him at work today. What are we waiting for? There are two armies. One is the army of the enemy. And for that army, the Lord says, Well, gird yourselves, call an assembly, get ready, get ready, do not let the army of the enemy destroy you. But notice, friends, there is another army in the book of Joel. And it's, in, it's found in chapter 2. Another army. And this army 
is a different army. Verse chapter 2 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion. And that's what I'm trying to do. Sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. For it is at hand. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountain, a people come. And this is the second army. A people come great and strong, like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them. Even for many successive generations, a fire devours after them, and behind them a flame, a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots, over mountain tops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble like a strong people set in battle array before them the people wreathe in pain all faces are drained in color they run like a mighty man they climb up the wall the men of war everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks they do not push one another everyone marches in his own column though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. They run and to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grew dark. And the stars diminished their brightness. The Lord gives voice before His army. For His camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes His word. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? The second army is a different army, isn't it? Whose army is it? It's the army of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you come to the book of Revelation, chapter 19, you will find that, there is, that this army is predicted, is shown here, Jesus coming as a great conqueror. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, verses 11 onwards, the prophet writes, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed in, in a white robe, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the, the, of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and the flesh of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Can you see in, ver in, that, in, the, in that final verse, verse 19, the clash of the two armies? Why Joel, if we go back to Joel, I was planning to preach on the whole book of Joel today, now why I will be able to accomplish it? I'll have to finish it next Sabbath. Why does Joel, in verse, chapter 2, verse 12, include the following words? Chapter 1 presents the army of the enemy coming against the church of God to destroy it and annihilate the church. Chapter 2 presents the army of Christ coming and we also are told that this is a terrible day.
Why? Shouldn't the Lord say, who? Be scared of that army. But we have, be happy that I am coming. Why, friends? If you come to verse 12, you will find what the Lord wants us. How he wants us to react. React. Verse 12 says, Now therefore say, says the Lord, Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Why, friends? I ask you, friend, why does the Lord ask his people? He tells them, Look, the army of locusts is coming. Weep. Rend your clothes. Cry. Gather all the people. Make a fasting. And then he says, look, my army is coming. My angels. They are coming like flaming fire. And then he tells them, weep. Rend your clothes. Fast. Why? Very simple, friends. The church is not ready. The church is neither ready for the attack from the enemy and neither the church is ready to receive the army of the Lord. Let me ask you a question. If the army of Jesus came today, now, before I say this, what is the purpose of the army of Christ coming? What is the purpose of the army of Christ coming? Is it, is it to destroy his children? No, the opposite. The purpose of the army of Jesus is to save us from the onslaught of the enemy, friends. But his children are not ready. Is this function working? It's not good. One, two, one. Ah. Oh, this, this is funny. Yeah. I, I'm talking with this one and this one is catching me. Friends, why is in both cases the reaction the same? Very simple. Do you think that the church is ready when we love our bank accounts more than we love Jesus? Do you think that the church is ready for the return of Christ when we love our fashion more than we love Jesus? Do you think that the church is ready for the return of Christ when we love movies, television, and entertainment more than what we love Jesus? Do you think, friends, that the church of Christ is ready for the coming of His army, for the, for the devouring fire, for the face of God? Do you think that we are ready when we spend most time satisfying self than what we spend developing the image of Christ in us. Do you think that the church is ready, friends? Do you think? If Jesus came tonight, do you think that we would be ready to go home, friends? And you know why we are not ready? Because of what the army of Satan has done within us. Do you love the sacrifice of Jesus above all things. Do you love His death on the cross so much that you would be willing to die for Him? Do you love His sacrifice so much and you want to become so much more like Him that you would be willing to put everything at the stake but not your relationship with Him? Would you be willing to lose the world and to count it as rubbish but to gain the knowledge of Christ. Do you understand what I say, friends? Are we in a state to be translated to heaven? Or are we playing at being Christians and thinking that we are ready when we are playing a double life? What will you be doing when you leave church today? What you will be you watching tonight? How are you dealing with your loved ones? How are you treating your people? How are your business dealings? What are you watching on the internet? What are you reading, friends? What is your mind fed of? That tells you whether you're a Christian or whether you're not. And that tells you whether you're ready or whether you're not. Dear friends, one army is already here. One army 
is already here. And that army is creating havoc within the Christian church and within the Seventh-day Adventist church. That army has created a generation of young people that think they can go dancing, drinking, and having sex and still proclaim that they are saved. That army has created a generation of adults that they think that they'll go to heaven with all their possessions. That army has created a cheap view of Calvary. If heaven was willing to lose everything, Jesus Christ, to save us, don't you reckon that heaven is expecting us to lose everything to obtain what he deserves? Amen? Amen? Amen. Friends, there are two armies. One is already here. Let me ask you a question. Who is your greatest love? Who is your passion? Where are your affections? Where is your heart? Have you surrendered a hundred percent? Have you given your life without any limits to the Lord Jesus Christ? Is He your Savior and Master? He, do you walk in the Spirit? Is the Bible the authority of your life? Is your character growing in the likeness of Jesus? By no means deceive yourself to think that you can go to heaven with one hand with the Lord and one hand in the world. May I finish this morning reading to you what the Lord expects of His people today. And it's found in Joel chapter 2 and verses 12 and onwards. This is the work that Christians should be doing today. Friends, today is no time for us to be jumping and speaking in tongues and falling down and speaking as if heaven is already here. Dear friends, today is a time for Joel chapter 2, verses 12 and onwards. And this is the word of the Lord. It's not, the, it's not Pastor Bragg's word. Not this what the Lord says to his people who are living under the attack of the northern army and who are waiting to come and see the army of the Lord. It says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and great in kindness, and He relents from doing harm. Who knows if He will turn and relent and leaving a blessing behind Him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priest who minister to the Lord weep before, between the porch and the altar. Let them say, Spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say amongst the people, Where is their God? What is the work? A work of deep Revival and reformation. But in order for there to be a revival, there must be a death first. I have been inviting you for weeks, for months, to die to self. I have been calling you people, my church, surrender your heart to the Lord. Give yourself to the Lord without reservation. Make a covenant with the Lord that you will no longer live, but that Jesus will live in you now. Doesn't matter what the cost. Doesn't matter what comes. Give yourself to the Lord. Let Him be the King of your life. Surrender, friends, without any reservations. He's the only hope. And when you surrender, when you die to self, there will come a mighty revival in your life. You will experience Jesus. He will take hold of your affections, of your heart, of your emotions, and He will make you a creature in His likeness. 
Again, the wine, the blood of Jesus will be supreme in your life. And the grain, the word of God, will be the most valuable thing you can have. Friends, have you died to self? I called you today. Have you died to self? Have you made that agreement where you say to the Lord, Lord, everything that I have, everything that I am, everything that I have been today dies and I am completely yours. If not, there is no new birth. There is no preparation. Friends, at this time, we should be gathering together as a church every day to pray for a revival in our midst. At this time, friends, there is no time to waste. We should be out on the streets telling people, get ready because the end is coming. May I give you a word of warning? If you have a block of land, if behind your, your house you have a parcel of land, clear it and, and plow it because in a few months you will need the food. Do not disregard my words, friends. In the center, we are going to extend our veggie garden and we are going to plant it completely, friends. Because soon, people will be knocking at our doors asking for food. If you have a parcel of land, doesn't matter how little it is. Now, if you live in the city, try to get out of the city. If you live in the outskirts of the city and you have a parcel of land, Plowder, if you if it's covered in concrete, get rid of the concrete. Concrete will not feed you, friends. Get rid of the concrete, plow it, and plant seeds, and grow your plants. You may think that I am crazy, friends, but I'm warning you because I know what is coming. It's not the Bible that is only telling me that, friends. It's the spirit of prophecy, but it's the radios who are telling me what is coming, friends. It's coming. Soon, people will be unemployed. Soon there will be no economy in Australia, friends. We need to be wise. Please. But above all things, look to your heart. Where are you standing with Jesus? I'd like to finish tonight saying, God never sends warnings of this magnitude because He hates us. Did you hear that? God never sends warnings of this magnitude. They appear to be hard. Oh yes, it's hard, friends, but let me tell you. I'd rather God tell me what is coming and me be shaken than be lullabied into death. Amen? Amen. I'd rather be in the kingdom of heaven because Pastor Brian had to shout in my ear than be lost. Because my pastor never said anything, friends. I'd rather be found clothed in white because it took everything that I had to do to surrender to the Lord and it was painful and hard, friends. Yet I, I am in the kingdom of heaven because finally I have given everything for Jesus and Jesus is my pearl of great price. Then be lost in the kingdom of Satan and be burned forever, friends. And I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to warn you. Wake up. Wake up, Australia. Wake up. There's no more time left. I know I have some visitors here. You may, you may think that I'm crazy, friends. You may come back saying, Pastor Braga, hmm, we'll never go back to Penrith Church. It's a bit of a cuckoo. But in a few months, you will think of me. In a few months, you will remember the redhead who warned you from the front. You'll never, you'll never forget my name, friends. Not because I want to be exalted, but the Lord has given me a message to pass on to you this morning. Please. If you don't like me, I don't care. But if you don't like me, hear what I'm saying. Because if I see you in heaven, you will come and embrace me and say, thank you, Pastor. Friends, please. It's not about Pastor Braga. It's about Jesus. He wants to save you. And sadly enough, he has chosen me, a vessel made of mud, to try to communicate this message this morning. In the name of Jesus. If you value your life, go back home this morning and reconsider your life. Is there anyone here this morning who would like to say to Jesus, Jesus, I want to give you my heart in full surrender. I want to crucify self this morning and sign the covenant of death with you from today on. I no longer live.
Is there anyone here who would like to say to the Lord that? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come forward so that we can pray together. Come forward. I'm standing here in, in, a sh in also making the covenant. I want nothing to stand between me and the Lord. Amen. I praise the Lord for your decisions this morning. Not because I want many people to make decisions, but because you are my sheep and I love you. And I know that if you continue with this decision, I'll see you in the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. Let us kneel there and we'll pray together. Father in heaven, the end has arrived. Jesus is just around the corner. We realize, Father, that there is an attack against us. Well planned, perfectly planned. And it's calculated to destroy us, either physically or spiritually. And dear Lord, we are not ready. Lord, we cry before your altar and weep. As a minister, Lord, I weep before you, Lord, because my sheep are not ready, Lord. And if if this attack was to materialize and mature today, maybe I and my sheep will be lost. In the name of Christ, Father, I pray, forgive me as a minister, as a, she as a shepherd. Cover me in your righteousness. And I pray for my sheep, Lord, today we stand before you in full surrender. No limits, Father. No boundaries. Our heart, our life, this old man is completely yours. You do with me and with us as you want. Take us in the direction you desire as long, Father, as we are with Jesus when he comes. Doesn't matter what the price is that we have to pay, Father, so that we, we and our children stand before you in that precious day. Lord, do it. Doesn't matter how painful Accomplish it, Father. We are giving you full authority of our lives in this moment. We can do nothing else, Dad. Nothing else. We are too weak. But Lord, we believe in Jesus. His blood is precious to us. His sacrifice means everything, Lord. Without it, we are lost. Please, Lord, cover us in His righteousness. Please, Father, give us His life. Please, Lord, may we, when we... Get up from our knees. Be brand new creatures in the likeness of Jesus. Lord, we are completely yours. No promises, but completely yours. In Jesus' precious name, amen.